All right, so we are going to get started to maximize use of time. Hello and welcome to Women in STEM, the Graduate Career Strategy Series. My name is Jessica Wilson. I'm Associate Director of Master's Career Development at the Career Center. It is a pleasure and an honor to have our panelists today to discuss what it means to be a woman leading in STEM. Um, and before I introduce um, our panelists, I do want to share a breakdown of the rest of this session today with you. We are going to have a 45 minute Q&A with our esteemed panelists. We will have 15 minutes of student Q&A and then have a bit of time to do breakout rooms with individual panelists. Uh, the beginning uh, panel Q&A will be recorded and that will be posted on our YouTube channel after the fact. So if you do not wanna be recorded, you can turn your video off and the breakout session will not be recorded. So no worries about that. And um, I want to say that this event is hosted by the graduate uh, career team at the Career Center and we wanna give a special thanks to Leslie Waysom and Laura Lothian from the Jacobs School of Engineering for their support uh, of this event. So very, very happy to collaborate with partners and bring in our esteemed panelists. Um, so without further ado, I want to introduce our uh, amazing all-female star-studded panelists. Um, first, we have um, Olivia A. Gravy. Uh, she is professor and joined the University of California, San Diego in 2012. And she's currently the Jacobs Faculty Scholar and Professor in the Department of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering, Director of the Cali Baja Center for Resilient Materials and Systems, and Director of Program in Material Science and Engineering. She holds a PhD in Material Science and Engineering from the University of uh, California, Davis, and a Bachelor of Science degree in Structural Engineering from the University of California, San Diego. Her area of research focuses on the design and processing of new materials for extreme environments, um, including extremes of temperature, pressure, and radiation. Professor Gravy has been involved in many activities related to the recruitment and retention of women and Hispanic students in science and engineering, and has received several prestigious awards, including the Presidential Award for Excellence in Science, Math, and Engineering Mentoring in 2020. She has been inducted into the Tijuana Walk of Fame, the Mexican Academy of Engineering, the Mexican Academy of Sciences, the Latin American Academy of Sciences, and has been named Fellow of the American Ceramic Society and of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Thank you so much, Professor Gravy, for joining us today. It is our honor and our pleasure. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. Next, but not uh, but not least, uh, Emily Deary. She is the Executive Vice President of Engineering at Shadowbox. Emily has spent over 20 years in technology industry, uh, specifically in product management and engineering. Before joining Shadowbox, she was um, the Vice President of Engineering at Adjuster from 2018 through its acquisition in 2020 by Double Verify where she continued as their vice president. From 2015 to 2018, Emily joined ARS National um, Services as their chief information officer. Prior to ARS, she was the executive director of enterprise information systems at University of California at San Diego. In 2006, she came, became CTO of data collections at Scranton, uh, before which she was Director of Engineering for Midtech Systems. Emily began her career at Cardiff Software in 1991 as the Director of Product Management. Emily Deer has a Master of Arts in Architecture-Based Enterprise Systems Engineering from UC San Diego, Rady School of Management, and a Bachelor of Arts in Computer Science from UC San Diego. Uh, among her exemplary talents, she has been granted three patents, and was featured in the San Diego Magazine as a 2012 top tech executive. In her spare time, she enjoys spending time with her family and three dogs and playing cards with her friends. Thank you so much, Emily Deer. It's a pleasure to have you join us today. And last but not least, um, we have Jocelyn Lowe, who is Vice President at Latitude 32 Engineering. Um, so a condensed version of Jocelyn's extensive background um, as vice president of Latitude 32 Engineering, 
She focuses her energy on securing new high value customers, providing quality engineering and product management services, acting as a liaison to companies prototyping and mass production partners around the world and providing mentorship and guidance to other mechanical engineers. In 2021, Latitude 32 Engineering was acquired by Peloton Interactive, where she is still working today. Um, Jocelyn looks to continue mentoring junior engineers, participate in local STEM outreach, as well as volunteering at events hosted by UCSD Engineering Department and the Career Center. Thank you so much, Jocelyn, for joining us. It is such a pleasure to have you today. So I'm gonna stop screen and also close my window because there is a protest behind me. So uh, let that not distract. Um, so I wanna get straight to our, our list of questions and uh, jump in, um, starting with you, Emily, on when and how did you first get interested in STEM? Thank you so much. And first off, thank you so much for inviting me here. This is a pleasure. I have enjoyed my career in computer software design development everything uh for 35 years you said 25 that was very nice of you i appreciate it um uh, and uh i i'm here today because of, of my passion for my job and how long i've had the passion i wrote my first computer program when i was 12 years old and my father brought home something called a trs 80 if you know what it is then you know you're you're beyond your years uh, I'd been playing Dungeons and Dragons as a child. We didn't have the internet back then. I run an adventure game in basic, not joking. And I made everybody play it. And I mean, I made everybody play it. Anybody who's passionate about computers or mechanical engineering or something, I have no doubt at some point you forced everybody in your life to, uh, to be a part of it. That was it for me. Um, I, my school only had punch cards, didn't matter. Took punch cards, did everything, came to UCSD, which was at the forefront of computing in the 80s and uh, uh, took a Fortran class when I was young. I, I have to tell you I was 16 because if you look at my year I graduated, you'll, you, you have to do the math properly. Um, and that was it. My, my career was off and running. Could, couldn't get enough of it. I have plenty to say about um, the complexity of being a woman in engineering, uh, the challenges, everything. But um, after I graduated, like she said, um, at a BA in computer science in 1990, uh, the, the um, defense industry was big in San Diego, had no issues. I went into artificial intelligence, imaging, all kinds of things. I've done startups. I've worked at government. I've, I've worked everywhere. I even worked at UCSD for seven years. And I'm going to tell you right now, tears in my eyes, thinking when I was just this young kid sitting in the you know Ames working on computer programs that I, I could actually be running the entire software program uh, system at UCSD. So it's been a great career and thank you very much uh, for having me. I'm going to move on to Jocelyn as well. All right. Well, you said Fortran, I learned uh, Pascal uh, in high school. <laughs> and um, yeah, so Emily's all about software, I think, which is really cool. I just don't get it. I get hardware, so a mechanical engineering background. Um, I first get interested in um, STEM from my love for physics classes in, um, in high school. And so the um, the teacher, the physics teacher told me, hey, if you want to go into physics, either you go straight into getting a physics um, degree and be a uh, you know, physicist, but you know, you could do a little bit more if you're an engineer. And so I uh, took upon myself to just look into it. I have no, no not much of a reference in my family uh, with an engineering degree. Um, so I kind of looked into it and I, I got in, luckily got into UCSD, uh, Jacobs School of Engineering, mechanical engineer, um, uh, straight in for my program, got um, kind of went through the five-year program, the combined uh, mechanical um, uh, BSMS uh, degree. Um, so, um, and uh, as Emily was saying, defense is a big deal in San Diego. Uh, so was cell phone back in the 90s. Um, I thought it was cool with a little Nokia cell phone with like one ringtone um, and just, you know, mono, monochrome. Um, I thought it was really a, a amazing technology back then in the 90s uh, when you're working cell phones. So that's kind of got me interested into the consumer product world. So, yeah, um, you know, kind of school got me into got me interested. So I'm forever thankful for UCSD until this day. So thank you very much for having me here today. Thank you so much, Jocelyn and Emily. And last but not least, Olivia. 
So I was, uh, I, I think that that it same as with Jocelyn, it's very common uh, to become interested in engineering or at least in the sciences uh, when you are uh, younger. For me, it was junior high and it was interest in chemistry more than, than the physics side of it. I, I loved chemistry and I had a great chemistry teacher in uh, eighth grade that was a motivator for me. Uh, yeah, at, at some point in high school, somebody told me, oh, you shouldn't be a chemist, you should go do engineering. Or, or you know, if you like chemistry, maybe you should do chemical engineering. Uh, and uh, But I ended up not doing that. I actually ended up becoming a structural engineer. So my undergrad degree is in structural engineering, uh, class of 1995 UCSD. And um, and that, once I figured out that I, I did want to do engineering in high school, it was a big motivator for me to... Uh, to see that there was a lot of infrastructure needs in my hometown, in my city. Um, I was born and raised in Tijuana, right across the border. And uh, the, the, the needs of infrastructure and roads and housing in particular, not so much roads, although some of that, yes, but more housing uh, because of city, Tijuana is a city of immigrants. Lots of people go, uh, uh, go come to Tijuana and and there's always a need for housing. So for me, it was actually a motivator that to improve housing for people. And that's why I became a structural civil engineer. Um, and then I changed my mind. I, I ended up doing a PhD in something else, uh, but not, not really disconnected from what I was interested in, even back from back then. That was really my motivation. That's wonderful. Thank you so much for, for sharing that with us. Um, so the next question gets to that. Who was um, your first mentor to truly encourage and motivate you to follow this path? Emily. Um, I'll, I'll start with that. Um, I actually am, I'm going to pick a mentor that, that's a little um, offbeat. In my director at um, engineering at my tech systems, which was back in the 90s, I was sitting in my office and I'm not joking you, there, were, there was this flame war going on with the engineers passion, lots of passion, right? Over the right way to do things. And I was like, wow. And they, they, were, they were from different countries. I'm thinking, wow, we're, we're doing this from all over the world. Turns out one was on one side of my office and the other was on the other. <laughs> and I walked into the CEO's office and the one I'm going to say, well, the, the, the man I worked for, his name was Morley Narayanan. And I said, I don't need a degree in technology. I need a degree in psychology because software is about people and leadership. And that's why I'm so excited to talk to everybody here. You can be the best technologist in the world that does not make you a, the best leader by any means. And morally, I wrote a, a few things down here that he taught me um, just about um, finding people and gaining trust within your organization. And he taught me, you can't, you can't get gain trust to everyone at the same time. You have to pick a few people and, and really gain their trust and prove to them you're gonna be a good leader. And, and get them under your belt. He taught me to balance people and projects. Obviously technology is critical, but people in software um, is, I mean, really that's that's it. It's intellectual capital. I, if, if that person walks out the door, I don't have a lot more to show for it except the code they've already written, right? So that that's critical. And, uh, you know, he's just, he taught me so early to make sure I build balanced teams and I care more about the team and the people I shouldn't say more, but at least equally, the team and the people and the technology and keep my team balanced. So I'm very proud. Uh, Morley, he's, I don't know, somewhere super high in Microsoft right now. But that's my pick. And Jocelyn, on to you. Yeah, well, very similarly, hardware too. <laughs> it's all about people, about working, and you spend so much time in your day working. You better like your team. Um, so uh, psychology, that's the right word. I, I like that. I, I, might, I might write that down for, <laughs> for future references. Yeah, I need a degree in psychology. And similarly, my first mentor or actually my idol um, was a, a, a young girl when I was uh, in my first job in Kyocera, which was uh, used to be just across campus. Um, she was 27 uh, when she became a manager of a group of men engineers um, in Kyocera. And I was very inspired by her. She was young, energetic talk faster than me um, and she's just full of energy and the one thing the winning ticket for her was that everyone respects her and 
really liked her. Um, even when she was only a 27 year old, um, you know, new, relatively new and young engineer, um, what, what got her to get promoted um, so quickly was her, just her energy and her passion for her job and respect that she earned in those short few years. Um, and I I was really inspired by her to just, you know, she 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 looks like me, uh, you know, one of the two female engineers in a group of about 30 um, engineers in a big corporation like that and to stand out like that, it's her true passion and just work ethic. So um, because of that, I kind of drive myself harder to be like her and uh, got to where I am. So I was forever thankful for her. That was my story. Wonderful. <laughs> um, I obviously in in life, uh, there are many mentors across across your entire spectrum of uh, times in your career. From I already spoke about my chemistry teacher. Uh, that was a an inspiration. Um, but what I would um, what I would call a, a true first mentor, like really somebody that was following through on making sure that I was successful and asking about my goals and, and guiding me along those goals was um, a Professor Joanna McKittrick, who is a faculty member at UCSD when I was an undergrad uh, uh, there or here on our campus. And uh, so she, is, she has since passed, um, but she uh, she was uh, on our campus in mechanical and aerospace engineering for many, many years, several decades, actually. And um, and I think that what I learned from her if, with respect to to how to be a good mentor is the, the capacity to uh, to listen, uh, but also the capacity to recognize uh, and encourage you to do the things that you you can do even if you do yourself don't recognize that. And so she had a an excellent skill in doing that. Uh, I take that into into heart, you know, I take that to heart because I would like to think that, that I can apply those same concepts to the students that I mentor at UC San Diego now that I'm a faculty member. Uh, so she was great. And my own PhD advisor was also I'm an amazing man. Um, who who understood me and understood also what I needed, and so it's you know I can I can speak about many others throughout my career, but I think those two in particular. I love celebrating the mentors in all of our lives and how they've helped us to get to where we are today. And those themes that I just heard are really people, right? People, passion, and listening and mentors who uncover those strengths you don't even know you have, right? That's really, really, really beautiful to hear that your mentors have done for you. Um, so switching the topic a little bit to the, the rough pieces, right, of your experience and journey uh, to getting to a leadership position, we know it wasn't easy. So we, um, I'm curious to know, what was one of the more challenging experiences that you had that really shaped uh, who you are, uh, whether at UCSD, in academia, or in industry, and what did you learn from that experience? So I'll get started on this one. Um, in, in software development, it, it's amazing how much can go right, but even more how much can go wrong, correct? So in the 1990s, when we were developing software, we actually burned things on CDs and sold them to people. I, don't, I know that's going to sound odd to you guys but that's what we did. Um, and I was very uh, young in my twenties in charge of an entire release of a product uh, that there was a bug on. And I had gone to print, gone to burning the CDs, artwork, boxes, everything. And, and we found a very, a very severe bug. And I did nothing but spend the next three or five days reprinting, redoing, fixing, getting it out there. We talked to press, we talked to magazines, we talked to everybody, said what we're doing, how we're fixing it. And we actually got accolades from the industry that we just took complete ownership and we fixed it. And at that time it cost like six or $10,000, which at the time was like, oh my God, now it doesn't sound like a lot, but back then it was, we were a startup company. 
And uh, it ended up uh, teaching me a huge lesson. And I tell everybody, we all make mistakes. People have accidentally, they thought they were in a sysadmin screen, but they were in a prod screen. They thought they were in a test screen, but they weren't. And they, I'm not going to say we've taken down the UCSD student system before, but it's happened. Um, that's not the issue. What are you going to do? Everybody needs to fess up what happened. Get us, get us the facts immediately. Let us fix it. Let us get it. Let's get, let us get ahead of it. Let us get notices out to people. Update our web pages. Tell people what happened, and then, and then we can all talk about how to prevent it in the future. So I, I really live by that credo, and I will continue to. So anybody on my staff can feel absolutely comfortable coming and telling me anything that's gone wrong. Uh, because I understand I've done it. <laughs> so. right. uh, that's a very, very similar experience uh, that I've had too, that <laughs> you have to own up to your, your mistakes and it's not the end of the world. It, there will be a way to, you'll find a way. Um, similarly, uh, my, my experience more about people again, um, uh, one of the most um, stressful thing for me, it's not a technical, issue technical issue i found i it seems like if we have spend more time uh talk to smarter people than me i can figure it out but it's the people uh, especially for a consulting company we are customer facing so sometimes uh customer is not the easiest to deal with um that was one case that really um, cost me a lot of stress um there was an issue that we just simply cannot uh, solve there was a spec specification that is just really hard to achieve uh, with a given uh, envelope size of the product. Um, so what I've been doing is try to please the customer and kind of pushes my team hard to meet that uh, requirement um, to a point where it's, it comes to data, we have to tell the customer that we cannot do it. Uh, we have to adjust the requirement, uh, basically go back to the drawing board. Was very stressed out, don't know what to do, how to prep myself in front of the customer to explain that we really cannot put this, um, you know, so-called a, 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 basically a PCB um, in that particular size and fit all the requirement, all the features in this. Um, but my uh, one of my friend uh, colleague took me aside and just just kind of calm me down and kind of walk through, um, you know, all the scenarios that it is still on the drawing board. We're still prototyping in an early stage. It's better to just kind of tell the customer that hey, we need to restart and re re-engage. Um, and recalibrate where how you know how big the product needs to go before we get into the next step where they spend tons of money. Um, so I kind of calmed down and kind of uh, kind of regroup myself and walked into the uh, meeting room with the customer and kind of explain it. Um, so what I learned from this experience is that you cannot drive yourself crazy trying to meet a requirement or specifications that are just simply not um, uh, uh, possible within the size or physical size or, or budget or timeline, what, what have you, you cannot um, push your team so hard that, you know, you're not listening to your team, that they are telling you, you know, all the time that this is not possible. Why don't you go back to the customer earlier on? So that kind of it really truly was a kind of enlightening moment for me too, that um, I do need to listen, which you know, Professor uh, Olivia had, had previously just mentioned, um, you have to learn to listen and you, cannot just, um, you know, kind of, this is my way, this is the way I need to achieve this. This is kind of a checkbox. I need to complete this uh, requirement. Um, just doesn't kind of, sometimes it just doesn't go that way. So um, that was a great experience for me. And now I, I have to reconsider, um, you know, all the suggestions and advice that my team, no matter how junior, how senior that person is, um, should be considered. Thank you. I think um, for me, uh, a challenge that um, was uh, difficult to not overcome. It's, it was just a challenge that that was over a, a specific time frame. Had to do with the fact that to come to UCSD for school, um, I was commuting from Tijuana every day, uh, and so that's not unusual for a lot of binational people that live on one side of the border and cross to school or to go to work in San Diego, um, but it just wears on you. Um, the, the capacity to say it's one more day and there is an end to this uh, is uh, a strength that I think everybody would need, 
that can get you through many other things in life. The, the capacity to say, all right, I'm going to do this border again, and I'm going to drive one hour to get to, when well, it's not one hour to get to La Jolla. Well, it is with traffic all the way from the border. Yes, it is. Um, so to, to be able to, uh, the stress of that and the, um, the every day of that, I think is actually preparing you, it prepared me for uh, a lot of other challenges in life. It seems so uh, simple, but uh, actually it's not. Uh, I think everyone will like, commuting is not easy. People that do one hour, two hour commutes are very hard on you morally, physically. It's very demanding. The capacity to say, it's only one year, one more year. It's only three more months. It's only three more days. And be, and I'm going to do this because I want an education. Uh, I want a career. I want uh, a, a success for me and for my family and for my community and for who I represent. That is, I think that's important. And that's a, that was a challenge for me. So beautiful. Yeah. So taking ownerships of your mistakes, knowing your limitations, right. And then putting in the hard work to know that it's going to pay off um, in the end. That's really, really fantastic. Um, so going to that, the next question, you know, what is the best or the worst piece of advice you've ever gotten? And uh, can you share with our students? So I'm going to start again, but it's getting harder and harder to follow. Olivia. <laughs> <laughs> Her advice is just so beautiful. I'm going to have to work on it a little bit harder the second half of this uh, talk. Um, so I think I, I have so much good advice and, 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 and quite, quite a bit of bad advice. So I'm just going to have to pick one or two. The, uh, I read a book about how to become a good CEO. And in, in my 20s, I thought that was a, a path I would take. I've, I've soon now learned that CIO, CTO is my is my favorite, um, my favorite path. But it basically said, you need to learn everything about a company, accounting, inventory, sales, marketing. If you wanna be a really good engineering leader, you can't just understand Java or you know, React or whatever you're doing, Angular. You need to understand how is the company making money from the software you are writing. Now, this book wasn't about software, but I, I was able to uh, glean from it. And I actually, at the, at the ripe old age of 29, I left engineering and I went to marketing for six years. I, like you, 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 I, I didn't want to correct you, Jessica, but I spent most of my career in engineering. It was just the, the, few, the few years I did, I did uh, marketing that you, you highlighted earlier on. <laughs> we call it the dark side. Um, but what I actually learned is that in marketing is where you understand the trends. Where's the market? How are you going to make money on the software you write? Lots of people can write brilliant software. How are you going to productize it, capitalize on it? How are you going to market it? Uh, that stuff uh, is what I learned. I, I spent time doing a lot of other things outside of engineering. And when I came back to engineering, I honestly felt like I was 10 times a better engineer. And I, had, I hadn't actually increased my technical skills. I increased my ability to understand the company, what the company needed. And uh, just super quick, the, I met this VP, a woman who asked me the question, or she was mentoring me. And she asked me, what, what, are, what are your CEO's goals? I was the CTO reporting. And it was Scantron, green, green little slips of paper. Um, what, what's he being measured on? What are his goals? If you don't know that, how are you going to be able to do your job well if you don't understand your your own boss's goals and what they're being scored on? So that's what I would say. And you notice half my answers aren't aren't, aren't even technology, even though I'm a technologist. Uh, just letting everybody know there's a lot more to being a good technologist. You have to understand the people, the company, and your boss's goals. So that was the best advice I've gotten. We tell students that all the time and crafting their resumes as well, right? You have to know what value this project will add to the company, right? So that's good uh, reinforcement. <laughs> Great. Yeah. So mine is more about career. Um, uh, it would say my manager in Motorola, um, I was just started off as a, a junior engineer and um, he told me that Jocelyn, don't 
you know, your focus should be to do a good job at your job and success would follow. And that is a very good advice for me and still applies. Um, if you're focusing on, like, let's say you choose a job or you choose a project to bid on and you only focus on the dollar amount, that usually wouldn't work. That is not the focus you should look, you should, you should focus on. You should focus on whether or not that job that you're applying or that you got to offer from and or the project that you're bidding on uh, would, you know, what, what do you gain from that? Or how much could you offer the customer or um, uh, the company uh, of your skill set? Um, don't look at just the dollar amount. Um, look at what you can bring to the table and what you can get ultimately in the long term. Um, and success will follow. Um, when you work hard and do a good job at your job, you will get a raise, you will get promoted. So don't rush on things. Um, and, um, you know, it's cliche to say the grass is always green on the other side when people are talking about a job searching or job hopping, which is very common these days. Um, you know, back in the days, I spent eight years in Motorola and it's unheard of nowadays, but you spend eight months in a company, that's, yeah, you know, that's too long already, right? Um, but but I truly believe that, um, you know, grass is always greener. You always look at you know, things differently when you're not in it yet, right? So um, absolutely work uh, hard and, um, you know, focus on your the job in hand um, and success will follow. Um, so I I think that there are two pieces of advice that that have uh, led me through through my life. And one of them came from, from Joanna, actually, my undergraduate uh, uh, mentor, who I also did undergraduate research with when I was at UCSD. And uh, in being in engineering and also being a woman of color, uh, Latina, uh, it can be, and I know that there's going to be a discussion perhaps on uh, imposter syndrome a little bit later. Um, it can be daunting, right? It can be. Uh, difficult mentally to adjust to to that status of minority in a sense and uh and she gave me the advice that uh Eleanor Roosevelt gave also uh and so it goes back to not even Joanna and Eleanor used to say that nobody can make you feel inferior without your permission and uh and that's so true uh, the the capacity to say uh you can uh, criticize you can uh, tell me I can't do it you can tell me I'm not worthy whatever criticisms may come your way uh, you have you have the capacity to say you do not have my, my permission and this is not going to be internalized no matter what you say and so that uh, that I, I follow through with that in my life uh, and so then the other one is really super simple. Uh, be good at time management. Just really pay attention to what you do, your schedule, your capacities. Uh, we, we can go through life with like hair on fire if we are not good about time management. And uh, there are so many things that we can accomplish as women and, and men too, everyone all of us humans, there's so much we can accomplish if we are mindful about uh, our management of our time. Uh, and it, being disorganized is like the worst thing. I hate disorganized people. That's not true. I don't hate disorganized people. Uh, I try to tell them, uh, not good, be a little more organized, please. Um, be a little more uh, mindful of paying attention and doing things the right way by controlling your time, by making sure you don't overcommit and making sure that you follow through with the commitments that you do make. So time management. Such good pieces of advice. I'm just, yes, nodding um, at all of it. It's great. Um, and now to that kind of question you just alluded to is, you know, how did you overcome any self-doubt and uh, imposter syndrome? And what advice would you provide to students right now who are currently dealing with this and will have to deal with this once they graduate and enter into industry? 
So I'd like to change my last answer that my best advice was from Olivia who told me to stop over committing and to do better time management. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you. Uh, uh, that's that's not my forte right now. So uh, that's why I love computers because I can get lost in in solving algorithms and algorithm development, do things that that make me feel like I'm doing something really great with my time. Um, the self the self doubt imposter question. I think all I hope me Jocelyn and Olivia is, is is probably one of the most important. And we actually moved it from the end to the middle because there there is a worry that a it actually, if you read it again, it said, what did you do to overcome it? Was that the question, Jessica? Yeah, no. Yeah. <laughs> How did you overcome any self-doubt or imposter syndrome? And what advice for so, um, so I have not overcome it. So I cannot answer that question. I, to this day, deal with people not saying which gender or anything, um, who can still command an audience with my bosses and and somehow get their point across better than I can. And I, I'm we're, it's it's a work in progress. It's been a work in progress my entire life. I'm 27 years into being a CTO CIO, and I still struggle with it. So I'm sorry to tell you all that, but I do have some good news some good news for this whole thing. One, um, when I was young, as I said, my very first upper division computer science class at UCSD, I walked into, you know, what did they make? Back then they made, they made us take like two years of calculus and physics and all kinds of weird stuff just to take one computer science class. But I hope they don't do that anymore, but they did back then. And uh, I took my very first um, computer science class. I took it over summer because I was so excited. And I, I was one of the few women and that's, I hope, okay to say. I, I don't know what's um, politically acceptable in this day and age. And uh, I did, I felt like a fish out of water. Completely felt like a fish out of water. I took, took it. And at one point I was, I was turning in an assignment and the professor said, hey, oh, you're Emily. Uh, you know, you have one of the highest grades in the class, right? I was like, no, I had no idea. And that gave me the gas, I think, to realize. And that was very fortunate. And that professor probably changed my life maybe. And uh, I was like, I was off and running. I'm like, oh my God, I can totally do this. This, is, this isn't as hard as I thought. And the, as I already told you, my passion for computers. So, um, you know, you got to find that gas. You got to find that, that air under your wings, find something. If, if anyone gets in your way and, and gives you that self-doubt, um, one thing I tell people all the time is, you know, sometimes you just got to get off the ladder, move over to a different ladder and go up it. Don't don't let yourself get blocked. You can't. I think Olivia just said it perfectly. And that's why um, she should go first from now on and <laughs> I will follow. Um, but uh, she just said it. There's, there's the self-doubt is from, from within. If you are passionate and you're good at what you do, just know. And I, 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 I'll, I'll wrap this up because I could literally talk about this for the whole 90 minutes, as I think we all could. Um, I do a lot of talks on DEI hiring, and I've, I've spent years um, doing uh, DEI studies and understanding how to get more women into engineering, how to get them into jobs. Um, why are they not interviewing for jobs? I try to hire as many women as I can, uh, but it has to be fair, right? Like it has to be based on your skill level. The one thing I just wanna tell everybody, Women tend to not apply for jobs if they don't think they're perfect for the job. And there's studies on this, there's papers. I'm not the expert on it. I just, I, I've just i just read as much as I can. I've got, like I said, a few talks I'll send to you guys. Apply for the jobs. You can't get the job if you don't apply for the job, okay? I promise you, a lot of people go in there with, 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 with a lot of talk on what they think they can do, and you're just as good. Just get in there. Uh, so that, that you know, this, this imposter syndrome is going to follow you. I, I'm not sure it's all women-based, 
but I do think women tend to hold a higher bar to what they think they have to know and, and, and society that's that out. Uh, sometimes other people are listened to more than you and uh, you, you just got to keep, keep moving forward. That's all I can say. So it's not gone, work in progress. Uh, and I, I, I can't wait to hear what Jocelyn and Olivia have to say <laughs> on the subject. <laughs> Yeah, 100% about your um, recruiting. It's uh, very difficult um, as a VP of the company and the only uh, woman in the three, uh, among the three owners of the company. Um, it's such a uh, initiative of me, of mine to um, hire women um, in the workplace, but it's just very hard. And what Emily said, it's 100% true that if you can get me the resume to compare um, female and male candidates, the female candidates have, like this resume of all these things, you know, ch charity events, like everything, um, uh, the more more colorful and more diverse than um, the, most of the male uh, comparable um, uh, 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 candidates, but they're just not out there to try to get the job. So, um, which ties into this uh, question very well is, um, he, I 100% I, I agree that uh, self-doubt is a, a lifelong battle <laughs> when you're a woman in STEM. Um, what I, how I deal with it or how I am dealing with it is I just don't take things personally. If someone give you a comment or a suggestion or objection or a criticism, I try to not take it personally. I try to stay professional. It is a, a you know, criticism to the project or a suggestions to the team. I try not to take it personally. That might affect my mood uh, because when you're educated and, uh, and just not in the right mind, you might say the wrong thing or you might act um, impulsively. So I, I try to take things kind of, you know, personally or sleep on decisions, don't react um, and, and just try to um, look at things from, a, from zoomed out angle. Um, if, if you are doubting yourself whether you can do the work and if you hear comments, it, it you know, it kind of play tricks on your mind. So you just have to take things, you know, lightly and, and gauge yourself um, to, to see, can you really do it? Do you believe that you can have what it takes to do this job or to uh, fulfill this, um, this task um, at hand? Um, the other thing that I try to kind of try to, uh, you know, lessen this self-doubt or uh, moment is, um, when I have a team, I would try to be uh, to and reinforce the positive of things. If you know, anytime someone do do a good job, I would say, "Hey, you th that was great. That was a great presentation. Good job." Um, because that works for me. When I get positive comments, I'm very encouraged, rejuvenated, and just like when Emily say you get a high score, hey, maybe this is this is good for me. I am doing a good job. So I try to pass it on to other people who have done good jobs and. Um, you know, try to be positive um, and encourage people. And you know, the word that you choose to to criticize people or to give you know advice, you, you can you know you can put it in a polite way, and uh, you know, not to uh, you know to sound overly like you know demeaning or whatnot. To be encouraging, to empower the team, uh, that helps other people to overcome their self doubt. Uh, hopefully, so uh, it, it's been working for me. Um, but I would also like to see what Professor. <laughs> Maybe has to say as well. Um, so, of course, I already mentioned this this concept of you know nobody can make you feel inferior without your permission, and uh, and we know where you know where it comes from. It, it comes from a, an amazing lady that was the first lady of the United States in the 1930s. And whenever I start. Um, doubting myself, I always uh, go back and, and am mindful and I take a deep breath and think about the people that accomplished what was seemingly the impossible. Uh, and I think of, of Eleanor actually in particular, she is a great role model and I wish I had known her. And of course I didn't, I mean, she was uh, long gone before I was born. Um, but if you if you think about who she was and uh, where she came from, she was from a, an extremely well-off family in New York. Uh, she grew up in an environment in which she was told that she was better than most people. 
uh, and this this kind of comment was in particular associated with uh, with African Americans, with Black people, meaning she was good, and they were not good. You know, uh, she was better, and they were the servants, and they were the not good. Uh, and they were inferior. And if you grow up in an environment in which uh, this is being told to you from a young age and by your own parents, how do you overcome that prejudice and that bias and that um, really deep down mental, uh, almost, um, you know, wa you know, mental like brainwash of, of, of who, who you are with respect to everyone else in the world. And she did that, you know, she became such an advocate for, for justice and for equality and support of, of blacks and the poor. Uh, and if you think about her, then I think that a lot of times her problems appear perhaps less trivial, less, less, taunting maybe and, and trivial in, in some way. And so the, the issue here is stop and be mindful and think about people that have overcome the impossible, like Eleanor. That other example that I have for you is Cesar Chavez. Now we're talking about a completely different person, a person that had barely an elementary school education. And um, he, in spite of that, he uh, organized thousands of workers to get justice for the farm workers in Arizona and in California. Now, how do you do that, right? What kind of mental strength do you have to, to achieve something like that? And so when I start doubting myself, I think about Eleanor and I think about Cesar and I say, si se puede. That's all. Professor Gravy, can you have your own TED Talk? Because I think we all want to watch it uh, immediately. It's so, so beautiful, so poetic. All of you, such amazing mm -hmm. advice. Yeah. Emily, you have something to share? I was just going to say, I have to throw the rest of my notes away after that. I just, yeah. I just <laughs> like, can up. we call time? Yeah. <laughs> Well, we, we are almost to time and I, I hate to end this panel discussion so early because I feel like you could give so many more nuggets and, and they're wonderful. But let's let's do one last question before we have a few minutes of student Q&A um, and maybe one word or one idea or one sentence very, very briefly, if you can, to describe what is your leadership style? Thank you. And I, I'm being a little tongue in cheek. It's just a, it, this is just, the, I'm, I'm enjoying the talk as much as giving it, if that makes sense. <laughs> Listening to you guys has been amazing. Um, and uh, I, I never stop learning. I never stop reading. I never stop listening. As we all discussed uh, with imposter syndrome or doubts, just, just, keep building. My one sentence is never be the smartest person in the room. If you're going to be a leader, you are not the smartest person in the room. I have many examples written down here, which I won't get into, but the moral of the story is you train people, you mentor people, you give them support, you get the best talent, you keep the best talent. And if you're going to be a good leader, you don't walk in there acting like you know more than the people you've hired to do their jobs. You let them do their jobs and you support them. Yep. So there's my sentence. Don't be the smartest person in the room. Yeah, that's, that's a great one. Uh, mm -hmm. Mine is um, along the line for my answer previously to positive um, uh, enforcement, reinforcement, um, encouragement, empowerment. Um, that's how the team work together and how the team win together. Uh, I think that I, uh, you know, I, 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 I've had several leadership roles in my life and every one of them is in some sense different. You know, the, the, what you do in the classroom, for example, as the teacher, as the person in the front of the classroom, 
is is different from what you do in in say for example a a director position of some sorts which i occupy two of them at the moment so uh, what and, and one of them is for research center and another one is for the materials program which is a graduate program which basically involves students and so they all are different on the day to day but they are all um all require respect for the other person and i think that uh obviously emily and jocelyn would agree with this and and they they've said it already the the capacity to to respect the person that's in front of you and to allow them to uh, to be successful and to allow them also to make mistakes and then to support in correcting those mistakes i think is is important as a leader and that's the i think that's the attitude that i take so it applies even in the classroom it's like if you have a student that is not succeeding uh it's like sit down and talk about what uh what you are perhaps needing to improve to get your grades to become uh, better um, but in the end uh, it's a team effort it is a team effort everyone has their own responsibility you need to allow those people to take that responsibility and to succeed and take the credit for that success because they deserve it and to fail as well so that they can become better rock solid advice from each of you. Terrific. I'm going to end the recording here.